And now for the scripture reading, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. And it says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who had called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Amen. Amen.
uh, part six of our Revelation series today, Revelation the Coming King, as uh, we look at the city of Thyatira. It's a letter to the tolerant church. We hear a lot about tolerance today, right? We need to be t people of tolerance, according to many in our culture. We're going to find out a little bit more about tolerance today. You know, Thyatira it was a really small city. It was a uh, rather insignificant city in a lot of ways compared to some of the cities that we've looked at thus far in Revelation. In fact, um, in today's world, uh, Thyatira would be, I would say, probably comparable to a small country town near a state border with a military base and a huge flea market. You know, uh, Thyatira was a lot like Middleburg in some ways. We're a small town with a military base. I mean, we're not on the, the, the state border, and we don't have a huge flea market. But, uh, you know, th this was uh, very much uh, what Thyatira was. It was, a, it was really, uh, it wasn't a very a big place, but it, it had a lot of trade and a lot of trade guilds. So it was definitely different than Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and, uh, excuse me, Pergamum. I always want to say that wrong. I, I'll probably continue to say it wrong, so you'll just have to be patient with me there. Uh, and now, unlike the, a lot of the larger cities, there's no real mention of persecution here in this the letter to this city, but it, it is almost a given because if you were uh, not part of a trade guild, not making the sacrifices to a foreign god of that, that uh, trade guild and you're worshiping God, then you're not going to join trade guilds and therefore you're not going to have a really s solid income like the rest of your culture. So even though it's not really listed here um, in the, as in the other places, it, it is sort of a, a given. Now, Scripture also doesn't accuse the believers here in Thyatira of making this compromise, and Jesus doesn't confront them about it either. So we, we don't believe that these believers had made a compromise of making sacrifice to a foreign god to be able to be part of one of these trade guilds. So there is a, a, a great indication that they were also under this persecution, this hardship that was all throughout the Roman Empire for everyone who was Christian. Now, Thyatira was unique in their soil. Their soil was really, it had components within it that could be found nowhere else in the Roman Empire for making dye, purple dye. And so we see Lydia, a believer who's mentioned in Acts chapter 16, verses 14 through 15. She is a seller of purple cloth, and she comes from Thyatira. So uh, this was what this city was known for, and because of that, it would trade a lot with the, the countries around it. And it was also, it was a, its main purpose of that city was really as a garrison, a garrison to protect the north. And so there was a lot of soldiers there. Now, in this, this passage, in this letter to the tolerant church, which is uh, Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses uh, 18 through 29, we see here that uh, Christ makes a command of the church, really that they should put trust in him alone. And that is very, very important. In him alone, and then directly confront the lies and misleadings and deceptions of Satan. And those, of course, can be brought through demonic spirits, and they can be brought through culture, and they can be brought through individual people. There's so many ways that we can be confronted with lies that may bring us off of what we know to be truth in God's word. So let's take a look at this passage. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. It says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. 
Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teachings, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and to the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. And so I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule with them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. And I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is the message to the city of Thyatira. You know, as we examine Christ's message to this city, we will look at first a greeting from the Son of God. It's unique, very unique. It's not said as a greeting to any of the other churches. There's a reason why. Second, a church tolerating sin. And third, judgment on the unrepentant. And fourth, a command to persevere. So let's take a look at this greeting, this greeting from the Son of God. Let's look at verse 18 and 19. It says, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, and we know that's to the pastor who's supposed to bring this message to his flock. These are the words of the Son of God. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds and your love and your faith and your service and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Well, Jesus once again addresses, of course, to the church, to the angel of the church. And we know that's the messenger, the one that brings God's word. And he says, these are from the Son of God. Now, it's interesting that he does this. He, start, he introduces so uniquely to every single city, directly addressing the problem in his greeting. The chief deity that was worshipped in this city was Apollo. And Apollo was the Greek god known as the son of God. And so he is, he is, he is addressing a people who know very much what their city is worshipping. The son of God, the wrong son of God. A counterfeit son of God, the pagan god of healing, uh, medicine, archery, music, dance, poetry, prophecy, knowledge, and light. He was also the god who could see the future through oracles, but more significantly, he said that he was the only god to intercede between the many gods and man. We know that Jesus, the son of God, intercedes between God and man. He is truly the one. So you see this counterfeit. You see this counterfeit here that's operating in this city that's calling himself the son of God. Uh, this demonic force, as, as we know there is only one God, uh, has gained the worship of the soldiers first and then the city. And so everybody is worshiping. There's a unified worship in this town of only one God, though there are other minor gods that are worshipped. This is the main God that's worshipped here. And God is saying, Jesus is saying, I am the truly the Son of God. There is no other. I am the true deity. 
You know, this reminds me of, of how God looked at the situation in Egypt with Moses and the Egyptians as they'd allowed all of these 80 gods of the Egyptians to kind of infiltrate in and they began worshiping each of them alongside of God. Like you can combine them. It's a synchronicity. Like, well, I'll worship God, the God of my people, the God of Israel, but then I'll also add on a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of culture. I'll add a little bit about what my, my parents told me that wasn't true, because we know sometimes that isn't always true either. We're not perfect, right? And we'll just add it all in, and we'll just not question any of it. And we'll just, it'll all just become one. We'll just coexist. I hate that word. It, it doesn't really happen, does it? And so, so God confronted this falsehood, this worship of other gods, these other ways that were untrue, they were misleading, they were deceptions. And he confronted each individually with each one of the plagues, saying, I am greater than any of these false gods who claim to be. So we see the water, the, the water to blood as he, he confronts happy the, the god of the Nile, and, and the, the frog, uh, the frog-headed god, uh, he Heket. And I'm probably mispronouncing that one. And then the, the gnats, uh, the god of the desert storm set. And then the flies, uh, you attach it, uh, a, a god that was represented with a fly head. And you see each one of these plagues, and God's saying, I'm greater, I'm greater, I'm greater, I'm greater, those are counterfeit, those are counterfeit, those are counterfeit. And finally, you know the last one. The last one, the Pharaoh himself was worshipped as a god. And so his son was the son of God. And you see that he was not, he was not. He was killed as well by that final plague. And every single one God is saying, I am God. And the Thyatira, Jesus says, I am the Son of God. So we see that Jesus' eyes and feet are mentioned here. Jesus' eyes and feet, the eyes are like blazing fire. And his feet like burnished bronze. Well, the, the eyes like fire, this is that absolute penetrating judgment of a just God judging sin correctly. And you see that. And then you see the feet. The feet are burnished bronze. That was the strongest metal that was known at that day. That was like us saying steel today or titanium or something like that. This was the strongest metal that was known at that time. And it was also the purest metal. Uh, so, so we see this, uh, this purity and strength in his feet Jesus is the strongest, purest, all-knowing, the one who justly declares, declares sin as it truly is. And he says, I know, I know your deeds, your, your love and your faith and your service and your perseverance, and I know that you're doing more than you did at first. Uh, that means you're submitting, you're becoming more obedient and you're learning, and you're growing, you're participating in the sanctification process, this is awesome. This is really some, some good steps. The word more is uh, more than, actually it's a combined word there, is a the Greek word uh, plion, meaning increased in quantity or exceeding. And so they're, they're, they're responding and they're acting more than ever before. But then Jesus confronts them in verse 20 through 21. Take a look at that. It says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself, she calls herself, she calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. 
So Jesus says, I have this against you, even though you're stepping forward. And, and I think all of us need to remember that. Even though we may be maturing and we may be growing and we may be attending church on a regular basis, we may be part of a grow group, we may be serving at church, we may be uh, doing the right things in our family, yet we let a little bit of culture slide in and accept it as truth. Or we say, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian Buddhist. How could that be? That's not right. Everybody's shaking your head already at that comment, right? We've allowed something to sneak in that shouldn't be there. That's what they were doing here. They were allowing this. The, the, there was part of the congregation, of course, that was not. Now, this, uh, this word against here, um, Jesus uses the Greek word meaning to charge you with. I charge you with this crime. This is what you're doing against me. You're rebelling against the king of kings, the lord of lords, by accepting this. I charge you with this. Here's, a, here's the charge. You tolerate. You tolerate. And think about that in our culture. You tolerate. Now, some versions may say suffereth. Uh, it's, uh, it's the Greek word for either one here, which is uh, a-a-o, uh, meaning to allow or permit. There's certain things we should not allow or permit as Christians. And by not doing anything, where we're supposed to be on the wall, we're supposed to be standing up for God, we're supposed to be standing up for what we believe, we're allowing, we're permitting we're tolerating. And these, these people, they were tolerating false teachers, false preachers. They were, they were allowing this woman to claim that she was a prophet hearing from God and sharing God's word when it was not true. That was not God's word. It did not line up with scripture. That's a great way to tell. If it doesn't line up, if it contradicts God's word, it is not. And, and this, was, this was not the time of the prophets. This, this woman was bringing God's word, saying that she was, and changing, bringing new revelation, saying this is what God says now is okay. You've seen that. There's a lot of churches that will do that today. A lot of churches that are not on the solid rock of God's word. That's where we need to, to find truth. We need to not search for truth in all sorts of places. Sure, there's some truths that, that will, you'll find, like that'll teach you how to live a better life or to, to, to be more devout or other things. I mean, sure, there's lots of truths in all the philosophies in different religions, but the truth and the whole truth is found in God's word. You know, I once knew a church that, that um, it was a lot like Thyatira in a lot of ways. I mean, they hungered for the word. I mean, they had great relationships with one another. They had great relationship with God. They expressed a lot of love. They were very generous, but, but they lacked accountability. That's an important part of Scripture, too. You can't leave it out. They lacked accountability, and they also lacked the ability to confront Put those two together. you got some problems, don't you? Yeah, and they did. Pride grew in their leaders, and bad character grew, and false doctrine ended up slipping up to the pulpit. It was overlooked. It was just a little bit of this, a little bit of that that slid in. And for this reason, there were some people that objected to what was going on, and they left. And eventually, the church was destroyed from within, and it closed its doors. And it was simply because they tolerated these things. Well, he's a nice person. I do learn a lot of good things from him, but, but he shouldn't be at the pulpit if he's teaching falsehoods, right? And so there was these things that were not confronted. It's the same situation here in Thyatira. They're not confronting, and that's, that's, that's all, it's a sin of omission. You know, you're just not doing it. When God says, go do it. Confront this, this falsehood. And so we see that the problem is one woman. 
It only takes one person, one person to slip that in. One person in the entire congregation that has begun to accept what the world is selling and to bring it into the congregation and say, it's okay. The culture says it's okay. We're, we're, we're a, an American church. It doesn't apply to us. Really? So it says that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, she is declaring this, not God. And this, this one woman claims to speak as a prophet, bringing this new, new revelation. You know, Jesus compares her to Jezebel. We don't know that this lady's name is Jezebel, but she's definitely compared to Jezebel. So let me tell you about Jezebel, because if you don't, you're not familiar with Jezebel, her father, Ethbaal, was a pagan uh, Sidonian king who worshipped the god Baal. He was a Canaanite god of fertility. And this pagan uh, king's daughter became the wife of Ahab, the king of Israel. He knew he shouldn't marry a pagan woman, but he did because she was going to drag him from the Lord. Now, her name was Jezebel, meaning exalted by Baal. Her name should have given him some warning. Now, the worship of Baal that she brought to Israel was really their downfall. It opposed everything that was God. Everything that was God. God created life and teaches that children are a blessing, right? A blessing from the Lord. A blessing to their parents. A blessing to their culture. A blessing to this world. And God's love was unconditional. And he blessed these families with children, and he provided for their needs. He provided for the needs of their family just like he did Adam and Eve. And everything was made for the one creation made in his image. But Baal, on the other hand, Baal required parents to offer their children as sacrifices to him. Baal's favor was conditional. If you didn't sacrifice your kids, you weren't going to get a good harvest. So during rainy season, October, you gave your kids lives up. So we can tell these are very different, very, very different types of worship. One is from God and one is from Satan. Now in this unholy union, Israel's king, he bonds himself to this woman, an unholy alliance with Baal, ultimately. And he provokes God in every single way by doing so and, and becomes more evil, actually, than any other king. I know he didn't start that way but he becomes that way because he allowed a little bit to slide in. I'm going to just accept a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, and now the door's wide open to anything goes. And that's how a lot of our lives can be, too, if we begin to accept any part of untruths that the world is selling. Now, I noticed something in Scripture that was a little bit different between different translations. I noticed between the ESV, NIV, and other translations, uh, the King James, that it, it says here that that, that woman Jezebel um, is uh, referring to them at, her as a prophet, which would be generally a male, right? Versus a prophetess, a female. And I thought, well, is there something going on with that? Because that kind of, you know... I would say raise my hair if I had any. Um, you know, as you see that, is she claiming to have the authority over men or something? What, what's going on here? But I just realized it, it, as I looked at those, and I looked at, back at the original Greek, that it was actually just a translation error. So if you see that in the NIV, rather than prophet, it should say prophetess, because the word uh, is actually prophetess. It's, um, it is prophetis. It's a feminine noun, meaning a woman who... Uh, Future events or things hidden from others are at times revealed either by divine inspiration, dreams, or visions. And so that's what she's claiming, that I have some secret knowledge that you guys don't, that God has exclusively given to me to share with you some new revelations so you can forget the old rules. These are the new rules of how you should live your life. And so in verse 20, it says, by teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality 
and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So her teaching misleads God's servants into accepting the error of Balaam. Now, the, uh, in this, we see the sexual immorality. That's the sins of the flesh here. And we see uh, eating food sacrificed to idols. So there's a compromise towards idolatry going on here. And she said, this is a prophetic revelation. You can now accept these things, even though they're contrary to everything that God has said before. Do you know what the, the word Balaam in Hebrew means? The destroyer of people. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? He is the destroyer of people. His teachings will destroy the church and the holiness that reflects his image. And so, in God's infinite mercy, he says with frustration, I have given her time to repent. I have offered even to her that opportunity to repent of her immorality. But she is unwilling completely unwilling. And we see this in our own hearts sometimes. Pride prevents us from being willing to listen to God's word, humble ourselves. I mean, it's painful to realize when you're wrong. How many people like when you're wrong? Well, we all are sometimes, right? I hope everybody's saying yes, right? We all are sometimes. Admit it. And when you do, when you realize that, you're like, you kind of get quiet for a minute. You go, oh, because it hurts. It hurts because you realize I got that wrong. And we learn an important lesson. Hopefully, we learn an important lesson. But Christ gave her ample opportunity as he gives every individual ample opportunity to repent and find a willingness to obey and listen. He doesn't want to pass judgment, does he? He doesn't want to pass judgment on any one of us even on her, but she's unwilling to submit to divine authority. That's what we got to remember. God's word is divine authority. If God says it, it is it. There is no changing it. It's not, did God really say? That's with Adam and Eve in the garden when the serpent wanted them to question and not trust God's word. Now let's take a look at verse 22 through 23, as we see the judgment on unrepentance. So he says, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Her ways, not my ways, not God's ways, her ways. I will strike her children dead. Sounds straight. It sounds rough, doesn't it? But sometimes we need to get attention. And God does not want to do this. He's been forced to do this by her unrepentance. But then all the churches, now remember this is a message to the seven churches, so that isn't just then, but now. All the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. And so Jesus uses in this, if you looked at this passage, many unconditional promises. Do you see, I will, I will, I will, I will, all throughout this passage? Next few verses, he, he certainly does that. Christ delivers a, uh, a final judgment verdict on Jezebel. I will cast her, Jezebel, on a bed of suffering. That is a sick bed. A sick bed, and I will strike her children dead. Her bold defiance of Christ has led herself, she chose judgment. But for those who are following her, I think this is really wonderful. He says, there's still time for you to learn from her and to repent. See the evidence of God's judgment on her and be convicted in the spirit and make a different choice for yourself. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely until they repent of her ways. You know, adultery is the Greek word moihuo, uh, meaning engaging in unfaithfulness. It's either intercourse with another person or emotional unfaithfulness with another person or in worship of idols, I found out. This adultery 
is here as well. And you see this as she's teaching to have sexual immorality and compromise to idols. So idolatry is a great word to be used in there, for sure, to define it. Now this judgment, it can still be averted in every way. Christ always offers mercy and grace to all of us if we'll just repent, admit we're wrong, and turn and do differently. Choose him. He will forgive our sins every single time. And some of us, it's over and over again. But he is so faithful, he will continue to forgive us as we turn back to him. Like David, right? David wasn't perfect. But he was a man after God's own heart. Then all the churches, I love this. Then all the churches will see this as well. Not just you who, who haven't followed her, but then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Christ's judgment here will serve as a call to repentance for all. They cannot hide their thoughts, their thoughts and deeds from him. And at the end of your life, there will be an accounting for all of us. All believers will give an accounting for our lives and those who have, do not know Christ, of course. Those who are still in their sin will be brought to judgment for theirs. I feel very sorry for them that they do not, that they will perish without salvation. But it comes only through Jesus Christ. And I pray that for everyone, that they might have that relationship to know and be reconciled to God and have that assurance of their eternity. And then as we come to, to know Christ, that we'll live differently. That we'll seek holiness, obedience, and, and be victorious over sin. And as we grow in knowledge and we grow in wisdom, we will be more discerning than to fall into those misleadings and schemes that are so obvious if you've steeped your life in the word, then you know truth from falsehood. It becomes obvious to you. So there is here a final uh, command here to persevere for those who uh, are not in this falsehood. It says in verse 24, through 28. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations that the, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, in verse 24, we see this, this uh, new so-called deep secrets. What does he mean by that? so-called deep secrets. Well, here's the rule. Here's the rule. I learned this rule a long time ago. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, uh, excuse me, if it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. It's basically saying this new revelation outside of God's word, and there'll be many of those, many cults that'll pop up, don't follow them. Don't accept them. Don't walk along with them just because they use the words Jesus, the Bible, and other things like that. They're manipulating just like Jezebel did. I mentioned earlier in the Garden of Eden, Satan said, did God really say? Did he really say? I have some, some he's been holding out on you. There's some secret things he's been holding out from you. But, you know, God revealed everything in Genesis to Revelation that we need to know. Everything until he comes again. There's no, and here's the, the rules, there's no special revelation now that will be given by any man. 
So we see that there's a special revelation to the Americas and the Jehovah's Witnesses. God has revealed himself to all of mankind, not just the Americas, not just to an exclusive group. That's a good sign of a cult, an exclusive group that supposedly has the truth, that claims they're the true church outside of Jesus Christ's Christianity. And there's no alternative gospel, something a little bit, just a little bit different. As the Mormons claim, they have the truth. And so we see in that one that Jesus um, was a man who became God. That should strike you as not truth right there. And um, that human beings can become gods. That should strike you as falsehoods as well. And that works can help you get to heaven. All falsehoods. All right, how about this one? Uh, no new prophets contradicting his word. The age of prophets, uh, those who brought divine revelation, it's past. And God now speaks directly to us through his word and through the Holy Spirit if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And God's truth doesn't change. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't change his word. And God is not exclusionary. He doesn't say, hey, I'm going to give it just to this little group, and this little group is going to be saved. The rest of you, too bad. You know, these cults like to say that, but that is not true. That is a characteristic of cults, not of God. There is no secret knowledge. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, do not add to what I commanded you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I gave you. Revelation 22, 18 through 19 says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life in the holy city, which is described in this scroll. So we should not accept Jezebel's message, should we? It says, I will, impose, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. He says, persevere. It is a burden to accept more law, more rules. I've given you grace. Do not accept this burden. Just persevere until I come. And to the one who is victorious, and you know I've described all that they had to go through to become victorious in the Roman Empire in that day. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority, authority over the nations. I will give them the authority that, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery just as I have received authority from the Father. I will give them that one, the morning star. These are great promises. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. So you're going to get receive authority over the nations as those who are being victorious over sin in Christ Jesus will rule over all the nations and we will come with him to bring that justice and peace. As it says in Psalm 2, the prophecies of, of the Messiah's power over all things. And Matthew 28, 18 says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. And then he dispatches that authority to us. And then I will give to the one who's victorious, I will give myself the morning star to you. You've got citizenship in heaven. You've got eternal life. You've got great rewards. And the best part, you have me, that direct relationship with me. So Thyatira, they're, they're a church that seems a lot like many churches in our day. They've, they've accepted a lot of things that they shouldn't have accepted. And there's a great responsibility for them to reject these things and persevere in faith. This means that there should be no synchronism or combining of religions, no philosophies or teachings from anywhere else. Accepting all of God's word 
not just part of it, and confronting Satan's falsehoods that lead believers astray. We've been called out from among them, and we've put our trust in him and him alone. To the victorious, the faithful, Jesus promises himself, saying, I died for you. Believe only in me. And upon his second coming, he will give you righteous authority over all the nations of the earth and establish his true justice and peace. Just hold on. He is coming. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church until he comes again triumphantly on the clouds. Hold fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ alone. Let's pray. Lord, there is a lot of deception in our world today. One of the four horsemen of the apocalypse has not yet begun his march, yet there are tremors of it. The deception is so profound in our culture. We are deceived in every single news statement, it seems, in every political statement, in every religious statement that seems to come out. There is so much in which we need to test and approve by your word. Lord, help us to follow you and follow you alone, regardless of what others are saying. Lord, give us a hunger, a hunger for your word that we're not anywhere on milk anymore, that we're desiring and seeking after deeper meat, that we have grown in wisdom to a point where we have the discernment, the discernment to know the difference between false and true. Lord, help us to truly be mature, as it says in Ephesians chapter 4, mature in your word, the goal that you want for us, that we might move from just disciples to truly disciple makers who can lead and not follow. May we be your people, we promise in Jesus' name. Amen.
recognizing the authority and trusting in God. And when we, need, when we trust in his word, we realize that his word goes all the way back to what was, they found over 5,800 manuscripts in Greek and, and many others in other languages. These original manuscripts, if you look back to the original word, anything other than the original word is a falsehood that came later on. And so we don't allow your heart to ever fall into accepting these falsehoods or these twistings, these half-truths, because the devil works in half-truths. Respect the authority of God and live by his word. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Sunday.